Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is December. <coughs> yeah. We like this North Carolina December. Um, I will take it. Um, but it's Advent. We're in our second week of Advent. We are in a series called Are You Ready? Where each sermon cleverly starts with the letter R. Last week, um, we had Redeem, and Tom brought us an awesome uh, spirit-filled message. And today, we're going to be on the word rough. And uh, I don't know about you, but one of my favorite things about Advent is just all the, the get-togethers. I like seeing people. I like being around people and hanging out. And, uh, one of the traditions that we had in my family um, growing up that I look forward to every year is that we got to um, come together on my dad's side of the family. A huge family, lots of aunts and uncles and cousins and nieces and nephews and all that. And when my grandma was still alive, we used to do it all the time. And towards the end of my grandma's uh, life, she was living with my, um, she always lived across the street from me, but she, uh, she had moved up with my aunt in Columbus. And, uh, and so we were up there uh, um, having a celebration, and all the cousins and family came in. And uh, my aunt's son, Ray, is my age, roughly. He's like two months younger. We used to love getting together, playing video games, and hanging out. And at this point uh, in the story I'm about to tell you, I was college age-ish in there, um, and same with my cousin. And, and he was always the, the weightlifter-y, trying to look good guy. And uh, it was very obvious at this point that he had let himself go a bit. Um, and, uh, and he knew it, and uh, he wanted to get back in the gym, he was self-conscious about it. And, and uh, so he, we were just actually talking about it in his room, we'd been hanging out, watching TV in his room. We started to walk down the hallway, and my grandma had this, you know those recliner rocker chairs? She had one, she would sit there all the time and sit there and rock while she would do like word puzzles or, or crossword puzzles or those little circly things. And, and uh, <laughs> we're walking down the hallway, and uh, Ray walks past her, she reaches out, and she smacks him on the gut and says, have a few more snacks there, chubby. <laughs> 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 that all of us are supposed to have, where you don't, you don't say things that everybody thinks and knows, you say nice things and you're supportive and you help people see what they're supposed to do by kindness, not by just tell it like it is. And, and you can tell from the look on Ray's face that he didn't like hearing that, but that he knew it was kind of true, and it's hard to hear that. We, we want sugar-coated messages, right? Well, I, I guess over the generations that may not be true, because, you see, uh, I liken my grandma to somebody that God put in a lot of the Old Testament, a prophet. Except, see, grandma earned the ability to just say things like they were by getting older and thinking, you know, life's too short to be around the bush. I'm just going to tell you what I think. <laughs> Prophets were God's way of going, what is wrong with my people? That they keep making all these mistakes and they won't listen to me. So he sent prophets. Now, I don't know how much you know about prophets. Um, some of it's new to me still. Every time I go to the Bible and start studying and learning something, so I have some new name like Nahum or somebody I've never heard of before. And I'm like, oh, this is a new prophet. You probably know some like Elijah or Isaiah. You've maybe heard of those names. Um, and there's a lot of other minor prophets. There's um, like Amos and Hosea and Malachi and Micah and all these other names. Well, a prophet, you can really almost sum. There's a few tiny messages that are different. If you went in a study Bible, you've got one, and they have that cute little page at the beginning of each chapter that tells you, like, what's the point of this and what's the, the point of almost every prophet was to get in your face with a rough message and just go, you're being bad, stop it or else. That was like the whole message. And everyone, if you want to weed out all the stuff that's in there, that was kind of what was happening. Now, in Israel, you, you may know the story about, um, you know, the Israelites turning from God, they're exiled in, in Egypt, and then Moses does the let my people go thing, and they, they come back, and they're wilderness, and they keep doing all this. Well, they're, they're further along now, and life is kind of good, okay? It's not great, but it's good. There are enemies, but the enemies are quiet, and we've made alliances with other little, you know, like, neighboring communities, and so we feel safe. We have some pretty good... Um, it's so a pretty good harvest. We've got crop surpluses. Our middle class is looking pretty safe. They're pretty happy. They're happy with themselves. Look what we did. They're feeling good about themselves. We made this. We grew this. We did all this. <coughs> they started um, allowing other people to come hang out with the Hebrew nation. And they started allowing them to worship with other gods. It's like, yeah, what's the big deal? I mean, we don't worship them. Other people do. And what's far be it for us to let that bother anything? And they start getting intermingled with stuff. And some of the celebrations that are supposed to be just for God have now started to become tainted or, or they mean something different. And so God goes, why are they listening to me? I try to do good things. I try to explain stuff to them. Maybe they just need yelled at. So he sends in Amos, who's a prophet, 
And Amos pretty much just goes in and, and it's just, I mean, there's no sugarcoating in Amos. He's just like, this is bad, this is bad. If you don't change this, the end of the world is coming on you. You better change. Now you can imagine, much like my cousin uh, and getting pat on the stomach and telling him he's chubby, most of the people did not like hearing that. And so some listened, some were freaked out. They're like, ooh, better listen to that guy. He's probably right. And most of them just went on going, oh, what do you know? It's good. The enemies are far away. We have food. We don't need him. We're good. And then Hosea comes, almost the same time frame, and Hosea speaks a message of love, that God loves you so much, and you keep turning your back on him. Why are you doing that? But he also has that same rough edge on it, because he's going, if you don't recognize God's love for you and turn back to him, there's destruction coming. Like, I'm not kidding. It's coming. You better fix something. And same thing. Some of them like this one didn't. The, the crazy part with him, and I like a couple scholars in one of these books I was reading was telling me about when he probably gave his biggest speech. Um, this will be a stretch of your imagination, but um, if you can imagine um, being in Chardon for a really wintry winter where it's cold and miserable, and then the uh, Maple Festival actually being pretty, okay? Like it's beautiful and it's like 75 degrees and the snow cone guy's not crying because people want snow cones. And the lemonade person, you've got your lemonade, your snow cone, your kids are running around, jumping on merry-go-round, the sun's out, and then some dude comes in with a bullhorn and yanks the plug of the merry-go-round and turns the lights off the Ferris wheels and goes, you guys are all going down because you're bad. Look at you having fun at this festival. It'll be like a funeral if you keep this up next year. And they're like, and they're like whoa, what is this all about, negative Nelly? We're doing good here. Look at us. We have a festival and a wonderful community. Leave us alone. But he did that in the middle of a religious festival. Everybody's partying, having a great time. And he comes up and starts shouting, the world's coming to an end. So prophets are rough. You see, Isaiah was another one that came in and gave the same message. He predicted that a Messiah would come soon. And if they didn't get the path clear, if they didn't make room in their lives for him, that they'd miss it. And the destruction would fall on them. And they did the same thing. A few listened. Most didn't. And then very soon afterwards, the, the empire of Israel fell. They were captured by the Babylonians, their temple was crushed, and their people were scattered all over the place. Some moved to different parts of the world, some got to stay that weren't the leftovers that they didn't want to take and make into slaves or servants. And it looked like God had just left them forever. And so, much like the rest of the history of the Bible, and this is the fast forward of the Bible, if you, if you haven't studied the Old Testament, I'll give it to you. God does stuff, people turn their backs on him, they cry, help us God, and then God gets them out of it, then they turn their back on God, then something bad happens, and they cry, help us, God, and then it keeps going over and over again. So now, we're in exile in Babylon, and we're going, where are you at, God? Didn't you love us? What did you do? And he's going, I sent you the prophets. You listened to them. I told you. And so now, he gets them out of exile. They move back, and he thinks, finally, they're going to listen. No more than 100 years later, they're sitting here in the same situation, and he sends another prophet named Malachi, and Malachi tells them, you're doing it again. Do you not learn from your past? If you don't change, destruction is coming. And they didn't listen. And God went silent. There were no more prophets for 400 years. And during that time, Israel was taken over by an empire you may have heard of called the Roman Empire. And people wondered and complained and got into complacency and thought their life was just fine. And we know what we're doing. The religious leaders were pretty awesome on their high horses. And the middle class was doing just fine and dandy. They had food. They were taken care of. Rome had already conquered them. There were no enemies. And they just started chilling. And God is sitting here going, what is wrong with you people? And I have to ask myself the same thing. What is wrong with us? Why do we insist on going? God gives us a message of peace and hope, and we don't listen. And then he finally goes, you're not listening to that? How about if I give you a message of anger yelling? We listen to that, and we don't listen. And then we just keep getting beat up over and over again. And I started thinking, there was this, this story that popped in my head of this kid I knew in high school. I'm going to call him Kevin uh, to preserve his anonymity here. But Kevin was handsome, tall, football player guy. All the girls, he thought all the girls loved him, and at one point all the girls did it love him. He, he was cool. All the guys wanted to be him, and he knew it. And he felt like he did this all by himself. He was the man. But he got to the point where it got to his head, and he thought that he was kind of untouchable. If you ever met anybody like this before, but he just thought he was cooler than anything. He was untouchable. And he, he would do really weird things. Like, he'd have your locker open, and he would come by and shove his books in the top part of your locker and slam your locker shut. He goes, I'll be back to pick those up. You better be here at the end of the period. I don't want to walk all the way to my locker. And they'd pat you on your bread, and you go, nah. 
Love you, man. And he'd walk away, and you're like, no, no, that's not cool. And he would really think that you thought he was awesome. And then he would, he, you know, his girlfriend would be saying something, and say something just obnoxious to her. His girlfriend's like, you shut her that way. She's going to leave you if you don't stop treating her bad. He's like, ah, she loves it. And, and it was just that way to everybody. And people would say things like, dude, it's not cool. Don't he goes, everybody loves it when I do that. You know what I'm talking about. One day, Kevin walked into the cafeteria, sat down, ate his lunch, and he got up, and there was this other dude sitting there. He was a wrestler, and he was quiet, never said much to anybody. Kevin sneaks down by the wrestler after he after through his lunch, you know, his lunch, the rest of the trash, puts a tray over there, he comes to mind. This wrestler who's just sitting there, he puts his arm around him, he's like, hey, buddy, now you can eat that, are you? And he grabs his bag of Doritos, you know, the little bigger bags of Doritos that you save for last at lunch for your kid, right? And he has it's still like three quarters of the way full. And he grabs it, he goes, and the kid looks at him, and he doesn't say, well, like, eh, and he starts to grab it, he's like, ah, you didn't. And he starts to eat it, he didn't really want this, didn't he? he goes, and the kid, and like, it was like, you could see it happening. Like, and it's like, this is gonna happen. And the kid looks, and he jumps up, and he just swings, and just clocks Kevin in the face, dropping the floor on him. Yeah, I mean, she's like, don't, man, it's not exciting. The entire school that was in there is like, oh, they're laughing, they're clapping, like, and, and not you guys are wrong for somebody who deserves it, but they were getting good. You know, okay. He's laying on a cold, lonely cafeteria floor, looking up, and it all clicked all of a sudden. I'm not that cool, am I? These people are laughing at me. And I just got knocked out. Why is it that it took getting punched in the face and laying on the floor for someone to realize what you're doing is wrong? His friends told him, his family told him, but he never listened. He was cool. And I have to wonder, is that our problem? Is that we haven't recognized that people that care about us, like the loving God in heaven, have been trying to tell us for generations? I got the answers. Just listen to me. And I said, well, it's, not, it's really that way. I was thinking some more about like life growing up. Like, we're a little kid. Fire's so pretty, isn't it? Like it's red and blue and it flickers and it's warm and, and shiny. And like, I want to touch that. And your parents go, don't. But you do anyway because it's warm and pretty. How can it hurt me? And then your finger burns. Why would your mom lie to you about that? She's the same person that feeds you and clothes you and helps you go to bed and keeps you safe. Why would she tell you something if it wasn't true? But we don't listen. And then we grow up a little older and we're, we're 13 or 14 and, and we're in middle school and high school now and we know everything. And, and he loves me. And he you don't know anything. And mom tries to tell you that kid is not good for you. It's like, you're stupid, mom. You don't know anything. I know what love is. It's just FYI. Mary or divorced. Your mom's probably been through a lot of stuff that's helped her to learn what hurts like. And when do you finally listen? When your heart has been ripped out and trampled on the floor and you're curled up in a ball in your bed with the covers over here and that uncomfortable sweaty with the thing and the, and the mom comes in and you're like, mom, why are you telling me this not happening? It hurts so bad. And she's like, are you kidding me? I start to think that must have been God's like upstairs banging his head on the throne all day long, going, I've been trying to tell you why do you keep insisting on getting punched in the face and laying on the floor while people laugh at you before you listen to me? Why? Why won't you just listen? Why won't you just follow me? And then we wonder where God is. Where are you? The same place he always was, trying to tell us what we need to do, and we want to figure it out on our own because we're so smart and we got all the answers. So after Malachi, when the world went quiet and there were no prophets, the Romans were in charge, God wasn't quiet. I think God was trying to figure out plan, you know, human 7.4-3. He's, he's updating the program again. If you got the iPhone, they keep telling you have to update your phone. God's like, okay, the humans are still broken. The update with the prophets yelling hasn't worked. There has to be something we can do to make this happen. And he sends a new guy, John the Baptist. John the Baptist fits the role of prophet really well. He's scruffy, he's ragged, he lives in the desert, eats weird food, and he shouts angry messages in a desert by a river. And people come from miles around to hear him tell them how bad they are. You brooded vipers, you horrible people, repent, turn, get baptized. And, and many listen. But unfortunately, just like every other prophet, many didn't. But this time, God's plan was just a little bit different. Because a little bit after John had been born, God sent another, 
a baby that would be different than anybody else because God said, I'm coming now. I'm tired of watching from up here. I'm coming down there and I want to know what the heck is going on and why you guys won't listen. And he came down in the form of the baby Jesus. And he grew up and John spent most of his life pointing that way going, I'm nothing. That's the guy that's going to change everything. We can just watch what he does. And so his plan was, I'm going to come down and figure out what's going on with you. I'm going to live like you. I'm going to live through what you've lived through. And I'm going to suffer through what you've suffered through. And he tried to love on us and teach us peace and care and kindness and trying to give us hope. And some listened, but most didn't. And he made his way to a cross. And he said, you know what? I get it now. You're not going to stop doing this, are you? So I'm going to have to take it for you. And so he walked up a hill with a cross and he took a punch in the face for every one of us. He said, I'm so tired of watching my kids get hurt and struggle and suffer that I am just going to take another chin for everybody. And he loved the world. He went back and clocked him on the chin so hard that it knocked him to the ground. The cool part is, is we get to see this after the fact. And we know that he didn't stay down because three days later he rose from the dead. And we have a living, risen Savior that went to the cross and took one for all of us. That sat on the floor of the cafeteria, bruised and beaten while people laughed and mocked him so he could know what it was like to be us. And then take that on, knowing each and every one of us, when he chose to do that, knowing who we'd be, what we would do, the things we would say, the stupid mistakes we would make, and he did it anyway. Why? The same reason a good mom or a good dad is heartbroken when you don't listen, and when horrible things happen, and you're like, why are you not listening to me? It kills me to see you. It kills me to see you hurting like this, and you finally said enough. See, I hate to put it this way, but I've been reading a lot of prophets lately, and they're making me think I should just straight shoot you. We live in an interesting world right now. America's pretty cool. You got the richest of the rich people being rich. Our middle class is pretty smooth. Our homeless people are actually doing better in the world than about a third of the world's population. Our homeless people are doing better than a third of the world's population. Our middle class would be independently wealthy compared to much of the world. Why? Because we're awesome, baby. We're Merck. We built this ourselves. God didn't give us any of that. We don't need God. It's going to be fine, right? Sounds similar to the time that I told you about with Isaiah. There have been people talking. There have been voices in the wilderness going, guys, come on. God has the right path. When do we come to him? When we get punched. When we get knocked out, when we get torn apart, when we get broken, that's when we finally come. And God's going, why didn't we just listen? There's going to be hurt in the world. It's a messed up place. But we bring ourselves to so much of it on our own because we just won't listen to our Father in Heaven. So I've been here. I was there. I took it on the chin for you so you wouldn't have to. So this Christmas church, the way I see it, we've got two paths. You can jump on the path that all of history has been doing over and over again, making ridiculous mistake after ridiculous mistake and going, we hear you, God, but we got this. We don't need it. You're old and dumb. I'm cool. You don't know what love is. You don't know what this job's going to do to me. You don't know what this is. I got this, like you could possibly know. I'm really cool. What are you, like 200,000 years old? Okay? And we just keep going over and over and over the mistakes, and we can take ourselves that way, and we can lead our family right down that path too, and they can keep repeating the same mistakes over and over again, or people, you can take the second path. You can look at the cross, and you can say, you know what? I'm tired of repeating this. Jesus is a better way. I'm going to look to the one that carried me to come down this earth, take a shot from me, so that I wouldn't have to suffer anymore. So that I wouldn't have to fall on my face and be laughed at. Because he's already been there. So church, this Advent season, 
May you follow the direction of John the Baptist's plan. May you come to know that God loves you. He knows you by name. Every single one of you right in here. He knows who you are. He knows every bad thing you've ever done. He still loves you. And he can use every one of those things to make you awesome. To make you a story to help someone else grow. Or to stop someone else from getting knocked out and laying on the floor. You're amazing the way you are. He wants you to know that. May you follow Jesus. May you come to know what it's like to have that peace in you that no one else can explain. That I can't even explain to you unless you had that moment where you just know the world's going to be okay because I've got the Savior on my side. And may you break the cycle. The cycle that's been looping over and over and over again. And may you guide your family and this community and this country and this world in the direction that God wanted it to be in the first place in our relationship with Him. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are so good. You are so wise. Help us to not be like I was, where I knew everything more than my mom did until I got older and realized how dumb I was and how smart she was. God, help us to figure it out now so we don't have to look back after a hurt, after a hurt, that we don't have to sit on the floor staring at the people <laughs> laughing at us. That we can trust your judgment, your way, your love, your kindness and be better than you. Help each person in here to feel energized by this message, God, to be lifted up and to be directed toward you, for their hearts to turn, for them to be open, to grow, that they might be a part of your life, your way, and your path. We thank you for this season, and we thank you so much for the gift that you sent down here, one that we could never be worthy of, but that we can't earn that you give us the love of your son, Jesus. And it's in his great, powerful name we pray. And all God's people said.